First, I want to welcome everyone here. I want to thank everyone for coming. It is a beautiful, historic, majestic, significant place in our nation's history. Also, uh, it, it plays a special role in the history of telecommunications policy and why we're here uh, to celebrate the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and all the benefits that have flown or that have, have flowed from that. It is my honor today to introduce Congressman Greg Harper. We have uh, something in common. We both uh, served Mississippi's third congressional district. I'm the former, he's the president. He's the powerful, I am the, the helper. And, uh, the and uh, but I, I wanna uh, just tell you, he moved heaven and earth to make this possible today so that we could be in this room, in this setting, to have the celebration that, that we will be having today. So I want to personally thank him for all the efforts of, of, of him and his staff. He is the chair of the Joint Committee uh, that, that runs the Library of Congress, that oversees the Library of Congress. It is a national treasure. And, um, and, and Greg, I want to thank you for making this possible today. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to you to welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to uh, welcome you and tell you how glad I am to be here and uh, see my friend John Shattig uh, again, uh, who we uh, miss. Uh, and of course, uh, following after uh, Chip Pickering, who is the telecom expert, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on, uh, on me on that issue. So when I get asked the hard questions, I just call Chip, you know. And it works, uh, works pretty well. So, But you are in the most uh, beautiful building uh, in Washington, D.C., in what I think is probably the most beautiful room. Uh, and so I hope you've enjoyed your tour uh, this morning. Uh, I know that uh, you had uh, Elizabeth Toma and one other lady that helped on uh, the tour. And so, you know, to be on the floor of the main reading room uh, and the historical significance of the 1996 Telecom Act, I mean, being signed in there, I mean, really, you just, you feel that energy when you come into a place and you see the, the history and the beauty of a place like this. And, you know, look, you guys are from many different places, but, you know, this may come as a bit of a surprise, but, you know, Congress is not real popular right now. I, I see the shock look on a few faces here. In fact, it was so bad, I was on a flight home a couple of weeks ago, and somebody asked me what I did, and I told them I was a lawyer. <laughs> so uh, that, that helps put it in perspective, I know. Uh, but, you know, I, I will say this as you get started on a great day, what the Library of Congress means, and to be in here, you couldn't have a better place for this group, and I'm honored to be here. And, of course, you know, I'm in my sixth year. Uh, Chip served for 12 years. And we followed uh, Sonny Montgomery, who served for 30 years. And so the bad part for uh, Chip and me is that no matter how long we might have served or how successful we might have been, there's not a building left to name in the district after either one of us, because <laughs> it's either named after Thad Cochran or Sonny Montgomery. So there we, uh, there we are. But uh, I want to tell you, have a great, appreciate what you do. Jordan Downs is in, uh, in here somewhere, or maybe out, oh, back over here. Jordan Downs in my office uh, handles these uh, issues that are important to you. If we can do anything, uh, please let us know. Uh, and I will say what, um, how much it means for me to be here with uh, Chip. Uh, his, uh, I was, I have always been a highly unpaid political volunteer my entire life, and the first race I worked on, I ran the phone bank for some guy named uh, Charles Pickering in 1978 when he lost in the Republican primary for the U.S. Senate to some guy named Thad Cochran. And so his dad also came up in 2009, and we were privileged to have him come up and do our ceremonial swearing in with the you know, about a 75 to 80 of our family and friends here, and so it's, uh, it's something very special to us. So thanks for what you're doing, what you mean to our country. There are things going on today you could never have imagined would be happening when you uh, were here in 1996, uh, and we know that it will change even more dramatically 
in the years to come. So we wish you great success. Thanks for letting me uh, join you today. Have a great day. Thank you. Well, good morning. It is very good to be with you. Uh, I am uh, thankful to Greg. I also want to thank uh, Comtel uh, for its leadership and, and helping put this together, and also the Broadband Coalition, uh, Kevin Joseph and Jeff Sharp. So as we start today, uh, I appreciate all the efforts to make this event uh, possible. I also want uh, to thank everyone who has come to join in this first panel, at the leadership of companies, competitors, and to tell their stories and the stories, most importantly, of their customers. If you, uh, if you get right down to it, we make laws in this town, we make policies and rules, but what really matters is how does it change the country? Does it benefit individuals? Does it help communities? Does it change education? Does it support health care? Does it give the economy prosperity? And if we look back to the 1996 Act, and if we look even further over the last 30 years at what I call the pillars of competition, the, the acts that made a tremendous, dramatic difference for our country, and why those principles endure today, and they're not only for the past, they're for the present, and they're for the future. And the stories that we'll tell today will give the narrative of why it's so important to maintain, preserve, and promote the policies and the principles and the laws and the rules that give us a free market of competition in all sectors of telecom and technology. So if you look back 30 years, the breakup of AT&T, 1992, the Cable Act, which gave satellite companies that were digital, that had a superior technology access to, to video and content, in 1994, 20 years ago, we started competitive auctions in this country, so we went from a, a duopoly and wireless to seven per market, fully competitive uh, markets. And over that 20 years, we've had four generations of, of, of network technologies deployed, and we have the broadband both in wireline and fiber and in wireless. It created an ecosystem so where today, Everything that is in this library can be accessed in one device in the palm of your hand. If you think through the last 30 years and then with the culmination of the 96 Act where we ended all monopoly policy, removed all barriers to competition, created the competitive interconnection that connects all networks to each other so that we have the largest functioning market imaginable. Creates wealth, innovation, investment, most importantly, individual uh, welfare and consumer benefit. The companies that we have today serve uh, everything from, from the small and mid-sized business, what we call the enterprise market, to the charities of our nation, to the schools of our nation, to the hospitals of our community. And each place is better because of the law, and we're here today to celebrate that, to reaffirm the principles as we go forward and to tell the great story of what competition has brought to our country. With that, I am going to turn it over uh, to our, our, our first speaker so that he can tell what his company is doing, but more importantly, his customer can tell what it means to him as he carries out his daily uh, work and the responsibilities of growing and serving a business and helping those with whom he works. So Chris Ansel, who is the CEO of, of, of XO, is our first panelist, and I'd like to ask him to come up and join, uh, join me at the podium and start the day. I'd like to thank Chip and um, everyone here today. We appreciate you attending. And I'll just talk briefly about Exo Communications is a competitive provider in the telecommunications space, serving customers large and small. And, and that really is the mission of our business, is these companies are at the heart of retail services, financial services, manufacturing services, and they come in all shapes and sizes. We appreciate the opportunity and focus constantly on the opportunity of 
how do we best serve them in their mission to connect to their own customers, suppliers, employees, and are proud of the innovation that we've done, the um, competitive access that we provide, the differentiated services that we provide, and to help them do what they do every day. Competition is important in terms of making that happen. It drives us every day to compete. It drives us every day to be better. It drives us every day to innovate and to provide those services that these customers need in order to do the things that they do across the spectrum of businesses that they represent. Um, to make that network work, competition needs to continue to be in place. We need to continue to have interconnection between all of the networks that are out there. We need to continue to have access to locations that are fundamental for each of these businesses in terms of providing their service. So I would just say competition works. Competition drives us every day in what we do to support customers. And I'm really pleased to have one of our customers here today to talk a little bit more about the things that XO does to support them in what they do. And I'd like to welcome Ozzy Brown, who is from West Star Mortgage, CIO, and he'll talk a little bit about our relationship and the things they do. First of all, thanks a lot, Chip, and uh, for putting this on. And I appreciate the opportunity uh, to come before you today. And also, uh, just like to say uh, greetings to all the uh, distinguished uh, visitors here today. Uh, West Star Mortgage is a mid-sized uh, company with 39 branches across the United States. And there is uh, there are significant reasons why West Star uh, selected a competitive carrier like XO. First of all, it gives us the negotiating power that we need uh, in our industry to negotiate service level agreements that are relevant to our business model. Uh, specifically, availability and information security is important to us, and we were able to actually sit down at the table with uh, XO uh, and negotiate and uh, come up with a uh, suitable solution. The second reason is customer service. Uh, we have direct access uh, to their leadership at all levels. And from my perspective, this positively impacts the quality of customer service and the response time. Uh, my experience, I've been a IT guy, a CIO, and a CISO for 31 years now. Uh, so I have some uh, background in the industry of telecom. And my experience has been when you work with the larger market carriers, uh, the challenges that you face when you have an incident or an outage is actually resolution of the problem and escalation of that problem. With XO, what I'm able to do is to pick up the phone and to get managers at all levels and stuff involved, which equates to productivity from my perspective. Uh, the third reason is influencing technology uh, and innovation. By working with a carrier like XO Communications, what it does for a small or mid-sized business is it gives us an opportunity to influence technology and innovation. And from my perspective, the diverse service requirements of mid-sized companies, and there are more of them than there are large companies as we know, right? It's essential uh, for us to be creative and efficient. So a lot of the great ideas and innovation will bubble up as a result of our participation with a carrier like XO. Uh, competitive carrier. The other issue that's specific to uh, the mortgage industry is the uh, regulatory environment that we find ourselves in. We have got to be more nimble, uh, be able to take advantage of business opportunities because there's consolidation that's going on in the market. So the last thing that I want to hear when I call a carrier is say, hey, you know, there's a business opportunity in Tuskegee, Alabama, and we want to take advantage of it. Uh, we need to be able to install those services very quickly. And working with a company like XO, we have been able to do that successfully. So it provides us the agility and the flexibility that we need uh, to drive revenue. And finally, um, my perspective as a professional in the, uh, CIO and CISO is this. Uh, competition uh, in anything makes it better. And specifically in the telecom in industry, I think we all benefit as stakeholders. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. I'm going to stay 
seated just to, to speed up uh, the proceeding. Now, our next uh, panelist is Michael Rulo, the Senior Vice President of Business Development of TW Telecom, to tell their story and to in introduce his customer. Thank you, Chip. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, spending some time with us today. Uh, I'd first like to thank the Library of Congress for allowing us to host this event here today. I'd also like to thank Senator Markey and Senator Pryor and Congressman Welch for their support over the years, encouraging competition, and the innovation that that brings to the marketplace. You know, TW Telecom, as a competitive provider, has long been an innovator in bringing new technologies to market. Things like Ethernet, and that enables our customers to do business more efficiently, more cost-effectively, to be able to scale and to be more competitive in their markets. And lastly, I'd like to thank our customer, Mr. Oren Strauss, one of our customers attending today. Oren leads a company, uh, Pantheon Software, whose mission it is to enable and empower nonprofit organizations through technology. And I'd like to introduce Oren to come up now and talk a little bit about his business. Oren? Thank you, Michael. It's an uh, honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you all. Um, as a uh, uh, DC resident for about uh, 18 years now, and the uh, uh, I've always loved this building as the son of a librarian, particularly holds a, a special place in my heart. But uh, um, uh, as Michael said, Pantheon is a small business, uh, originally founded in 1994. Uh, my partner and I acquired it in 2004. When we acquired it, had all of five employees. Today, uh, we're up at about 105 employees. So we've grown pretty rapidly over the last 10 years. And uh, our goal is to serve mission-driven organizations, particularly focused here in the D.C. area, associations and nonprofits who uh, look to uh, do good across healthcare, education, and, and social impact uh, markets. And we provide a range of technology services, really helping them figure out how to utilize technology to impact their mission. Accordingly, we take great pride in uh, not just being technologists, but really in getting into the details of what our customers do. Um, as you might imagine, as a, a software development company, as a technology company, uh, and as one with employees uh, around the country and even across the globe, uh, broadband internet access is 100% is mission critical for what we do. It's all that we do. Everything we do is online. And uh, we were thrilled to um, engage uh, three years ago with TW Telecom. Uh, our building didn't have fiber in it, even though we're just across the river in a pretty high-tech area in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Our building wasn't lit, and TW took the initiative to do so, worked with us to kind of negotiate the deal, did it very quickly, and uh, I can happily say that in the three years we've had their service, uh, we have had 100% uptime. And for us, that when it comes to mission critical, what more can you ask for? So we've been uh, thrilled to be a customer. It's been fantastic service. The bandwidth has been great. And for a company like ours that uh, the internet is our business, we live and die by it. We're on it all the time. Our employees, our customers, uh, that's what we need. And, and great companies like TW are, are a big part of what allows us to do what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next uh, panelist, Deb Ward, is the new chairwoman of, and the first uh, woman chair of the Comtel uh, Board. We, we're very glad to have her leadership. She serves the nonprofits in our country, so um, uh, the American Red Cross, the United Way, all across uh, our country. So as you talk about a network that is both uh, competitive and economically uh, sound and good, it also is a network that does good. So we're very glad to have her and her story and if she could come and join us now. Good morning. Wow, what a wonderful venue. Goosebumps. To think back to 1996 when the Telecom Act was signed, it was about a simple phone call today it's about the internet. It's about broadband. How many of you have 
a smartphone. Can we see a show of hands? Virtually everybody in this room. On the ride over here, I was in the cab and they had an announcement on the radio. It was going to be a record heat, 96 degrees today. And it reminded me that we serve a purpose. At TSI, we have a messaging service. The utility companies that we provide service to send out mass messages to consumers that utilize their utility, letting them know that in this type of a condition, there could potentially be a blackout and they need to take precautions. So it's really giving back. It's about that public safety. It's not just about being a long distance carrier anymore. It's about competition, innovation, having the playing field where it's fair and equitable, not just the large incumbents that'll drive that innovation and also provide those products and services that our consumers are so in need of. The other opportunity we found was in a niche market and that was in the charitable space. Companies like American Red Cross during disaster, they need the ability to communicate effectively and inexpensively so the money that is raised by those organizations actually go to the cause, not the administrative expenses associated with raising those funds. And we're part of that, created the, the messaging. We have thousands and thousands of ports of equipment that allow them to send out massive phone calls during a disaster. And that wouldn't have been possible had it not have been for the 96 Telecom Act. The technology is changing, but the need is the same. Competition, competition, and competition. And I'm very grateful and thankful that I can be part of it and look forward to having a tiny impact in that regard. Thank you. I'm very proud to announce that today that we are kicking off a website, Customers for Competition. And if you'll look to the screens on uh, both sides, we will be building the stories all over the country from customers that benefit from competition. You're hearing part of the story today, but this is going to be a growing, emerging story and, and coalition as we face the, the issues at the FCC and the possible reform of the Telecom Act as we go into future Congresses. There is a broad group of businesses, individuals, and communities that need the same policy, the same principle of competition, and we'll be putting that coalition and telling their, their stories to, uh, uh, telling their stories as we go forward in the debates to come. So please uh, look at customers for competition, and we will be, uh, we'll be telling those stories for, for uh, a long time. Our next guest is Tim Coxlean, CEO of Rural Health Telecom. Uh, Tim, if you'd come. And I also want to recognize uh, his parents are here uh, with him today. We have a short video. Um, I'm lucky enough to be here. I, it was a Father's Day last minute thing. And hey, Dad, how about going to Washington, D.C. and having a nice uh, couple of days sightseeing? And so they were lucky enough to be invited today, too. And I thank you, Chip, for giving them the opportunity to be here. I'm from a small town in west central Wisconsin, and rural uh, virtues are something I grew up with. Uh, Thirty plus years ago, I worked in that building across the street, a remarkable time in my life that gave me an opportunity to make a difference. And we've been doing it uh, a lot here over the last few years with Rural Health Telecom. We've got this video, and I'll let you kind of start that for a moment. That farmhouse is a farmhouse that was built by my grandparents. Uh, my father grew up in that house, and there was telemedicine, telehealth technology that helped my grandfather at the time stay in that house. Just a little simple thing of having a button, a call button that says, I need help, out in the middle of nowhere of west central Wisconsin. The technology has changed a lot, and it's through innovation that the Telecommunications Act in 1996 and further efforts by folks like Congressman Harper on promoting and pursuing better telehealth legislation that can help us 
do more than just having a button on a person's chain around their neck. Uh, so we, that's what we do. We try to deliver a service that can help our healthcare partner provide a, the best healthcare they can to their communities in the cities throughout, or towns throughout rural America. So thanks for listening. So charities, business, healthcare, public safety. Our next speaker, Louis Fiore, chair of the alarm industry. Uh, if you'd come up, and as we uh, look at the very important benefit to public safety and to individual safety. Okay, hey, thank you, Chip, and all, that, all those of you that made this event possible, and thank you for inviting me to speak on behalf of the alarm uh, industry, which, by the way, is made up primarily of very, very small uh, companies. Even our larger companies, by some measures, could be considered small companies. I currently serve as a chairman of the Alarm Industry Communications Committee. That committee includes installation monitoring companies across the country, alarm monitoring manufacturers, and the three major alarm associations giving uh, the industry a voice in Washington uh, in front of Congress and the FCC on communication matters. AICC member companies protect over 30 million residential businesses, sensitive facilities, and their occupants from fire, burglary, carbon monoxide, sabotage, and medical emergencies. Protective facilities include government offices, power plants, hospitals, dams, as well as banks, schools, and universities. This makes us an integral part of the public safety network. Accordingly, our greatest concern is that any future Telecom Act allows us to continue to protect the safety and property of our customers as well as protecting seniors facing medical emergencies. We depend upon three basic principles. One, reliable and stable communication networks and services essential to those networks to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Two, the availability of radio spectrum, both licensed and unlicensed, based upon rules that are fair and stable. And third, the transmission of, a, of our alarm data signals, that which are not blocked or hindered in any way by any network service provider. In a recent survey, we found out about two-thirds of our customers still require traditional landlines or its VOIP equivalent for the transmission of alarm data. To help ensure reliable traditional network services, the, Na the National Fire Protection Association codified standards which established minimal requirements for how networks should perform. These standards need to be adopted by all network providers to ensure reliable transmission of, of alarm data from both legacy and newer systems. One of those standards would require broadband providers to provide sufficient backup power at our customers' premises and throughout their networks which would ensure operation during emergencies. The importance of this became very evident in the wake of Superstorm Sandy, where cell service was degraded and landline service was totally suspended, in large part because of the degradation of power backup needed to run those networks. In the area of wireless, the availability of unlicensed spectrum has spawned a revolution in the ability to protect the public. Consumers have benefited from the development of services such as wireless cameras, door and window contacts and panic buttons and medical emergency buttons that provide enhanced capability at reduced cost. Many more are to follow, especially in the area of health care. A revised Communication Act should ensure that adic adequate portions of the spectrum are set aside to, for innovative unlicensed spectrum utilization. Beyond just safety, any new telecom act should preserve the existing protections codified as part of the 1996 rewrite of the Telecommunication Act, which safeguarded the alarm industry's right to equal access and non-discriminatory service, especially when network providers uh, have their, their own competitive alarm services. As the nation's largest telecommunic carriers become providers as well, it is imperative that they not be allowed to use their telecommunication networks as a means of unfair competition advantage over the rest of the alarm industry. Thank you. We have a, a special guest, uh, Congressman uh, Peter Welch has joined us from Vermont. He is on the Energy and Commerce Committee. 
He is also the co-chair of the, of the Rural Telecommunications Working Group and a, a leader on telecom and technology issues. We'd like to ask him to come up. I know that his time uh, is, is constrained. And then if we could go ahead and change out this panel, we're going to come back to Jim Butman. And if our members, uh, Chairman Bliley and Congressman Shattuck, I see uh, Chairman Pryor has just walked in. If y'all could please join us up on the panel. We'll, we'll begin our second panel, and then we'll come back and close with a very fitting Jim Butman uh, story on uh, education and rural telecommunication. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Chip, you know, we need you back in Congress. The last time we passed a good bill, I think, was 96. So thanks for doing that. There's some faint uh, afterglow of that success, and we got more work to do. Uh, but you got uh, Senator Pryor here who's going to be telling you how he's going to get it done uh, in that Senate. That uh, The Senate and the House are, as you know, so functional. We're getting things done lickety-split. But, you know, uh, I'll be quick. I, guess I, you know, I know you want to hear from Senator Pryor, too. But what Chip said, um, and what, that, what was that film? The rural challenges in this country are enormous. And I represent a rural district. And you know, the way it works is that the big guys actually like to go into the big cities where there's a real market advantage and you make more for less. But you know what? There's folks in rural America who need broadband, who need cell service, who need modern uh, communications every bit as much as everyone else. And we've got to make that real. We did it with electricity. It was a long political battle, but it was really the proposition that we're all in this together and that rural America has to have access to the same tools uh, that we have in the cities. And in fact, in this economy, that's even more uh, the case because out in rural Vermont, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs who are connected as long as they're wired and have really good service uh, to any job that they want to do. So for us, this is a matter of economic survival. And that means there's got to be competition and that means that when your companies are willing to go out in some of these rural areas, you can't get hammered uh, with regulations and with pricing uh, and with technology that makes it impossible for you to hook up onto the big system uh, that penetrates through the entire country. Uh, that's why Bob Ladd and I formed the Rural Caucus. We've got 20 members, about half and half, half R's, half D's, where we are united in the proposition uh, that it's not a Republican Democratic thing. We all represent folks in rural areas and we've got to have policies that work for rural America. You guys are on the leading edge. You know, I uh, talk to Pat Williams a lot. He doesn't let me forget where I'm from. And Chip's, Chip does a great job, he really does. And uh, w with a combination of his experience and practical approach uh, to problem solving, and that's what we need. You guys, we've got to have you providing the services uh, that every single American needs. You're doing the job. We want to have policies that make it possible for you to be successful because if you can succeed, rural America can succeed as well. So thank you very much for letting me join you today. Peter, thank you very much. I would like to introduce uh, Senator Mark Pryor, uh, a neighbor uh, from Mississippi or a neighbor next to Mississippi the great state of Arkansas. Uh, Mark is a good friend. He's a great leader. He's uh, chair of the, of the Senate Telecommunications Subcommittee. And as these issues come before the Senate, his, uh, his wisdom and uh, the approach that he takes in, in a balanced and fair way is greatly appreciated. So let me introduce Mark Pryor. We also have something in common. Our two states struggle in many areas but we lead the nation in broadband wireless deployments because we've had competitive regional providers that have built out to the rural as well as to the urban areas of our state. And it just demonstrates competition works everywhere, every time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did y'all hear how magnanimous he was about Arkansas? Yeah. That's because that, they beat us in football the last three years in a row. So. <laughs> You can say that. But anyway, listen, thank you all for being here. I wish I had more time. The plan was for me to have more time, but we have the agriculture appropriation bill on the floor, which, by the way, has a lot of rural broadband, rural telecom uh, stuff in it. So Senator Mikulski uh, wants me over there at 11 o'clock sharp to 
to get going. So I'm, I need to duck, duck out much earlier than I wanted to. I really had to come here just to listen, say a few words, and hear what you, you all were talking about, thinking about. One quick thing about appropriations in the Senate. We are trying to get back on track. That, that's a good sign. That's good news. Um, and what I've told many people is that um, in, in the Senate, you know, for years, uh, Senator Inouye um, and Senator Byrd were the chairs of appropriations. And we all had total respect for Senator Byrd, and everybody just loves Senator Inouye. Now that Senator Mikulski's there, we're all afraid of Senator Mikulski. So <laughs> when she says be there at 11, I'm going to be there at 5 or 10 till to make sure that our ducks are in a row. No, she's great, and we, we are actually trying to do some good things uh, when it comes to appropriations in the Senate, so we really are trying to do that. Let me just say a few words very quickly, and one, let me just touch on rural. Um, rural is uh, something that obviously is near and dear to my heart because Arkansas is so rural. Many of your states have significant rural areas that um, need to be uh, focused on, and if we kind of do a one-size-fits-all here in Washington, chances are rural gets left behind. And what you don't want to see in, in telecom or anything else is you don't want to see the tale of two Americas where, you know, the urban and suburban areas get the best and the latest and the greatest, the most cutting edge, most of everything, and then rural America is totally left behind, gets second, third, fourth generations, you know, behind of what everybody else has because that's really bad for the country. So. We need to have that focus on rural America. One size fits all usually doesn't work for rural America. So uh, I'm glad that this group sees that, acknowledges that, uh, wants to, you know, wants to be part of that solution. I think that's great. The other thing that Chip mentioned, which is exactly right, <clears throat> is competition is very, very good. When you have competition, it solves a lot of other problems. Uh, when you have true competition where companies can get in and compete for customers, compete for business. That's the way the market ought to work. And we all know how this market is with the immense amount of capital it takes to do what you need to do in the telecom world today. So that's a challenge. It's a challenge keeping a competitive marketplace, but it is something I think is very essential as we go forward. And also with the IP transition that we're seeing right now, we've had a couple of hearings on this in the subcommittee on, on, on commerce and the Senate side. And, you know, IP is, is just extremely uh, important. We, we need to, as I would say, it gives us an opportunity to try to get some things right as we go through this. Uh, you don't want to go through a big transition like that and get it wrong because there again, you pay consequences for a long time. So I think it gives us an opportunity to really get some things right. And also I know that many people here are looking at this FCC, and they see a very hands-on, very aggressive FCC. I think in a lot of ways, what I hear from a lot of people is they like that because it's a sort of a can-do, let's get in there, let's get it done, let's problem solve, let's get this issue done and move on to other pressing matters. But at the same time, here again, you don't want to sacrifice getting it right just for getting it done quickly. So I know the FCC, they really have their hands full. You all know, Lord, they've got so many different things going over there, but I appreciate them. I appreciate them trying to get it right and trying to do all the right things that they are trying to do. So we continue to work with them. We continue to talk to them just almost on a daily uh, basis. But again, I just want to say thank you for doing what you do. What, what, what you all do is very important for the country. Uh, it's really one of the primary drivers in the U.S. economy. Uh, we want to make sure the entire U.S. economy can participate in that, not just the urban and suburban that I mentioned before, and not just a small number of companies, but try to open that up and let a lot of people compete and do good things. So, again, thank you all for getting together today, and I, I know you're going to have others, so I'm going to get out of the way, and I want to race back over to the Senate floor. But anyway, thank you all for being here, and thanks for your interest. And you all know in my office I've got Hank Kilgore who's here. Uh, right here, and some of y'all know Hank very well, and he's probably on your speed dial for some of you. And uh, if I'm not around, I always call Hank, and we have a great team, and then we have a team on the Commerce uh, Committee staff as well that we all work very, very closely together. So again, thank you, Chip. Thanks for inviting me and including me in this, and always have that open door. always want to hear how I can help. Thank you very, very much.
Senator Pryor, we, we're very grateful that out of your busy schedule that you came over today. Uh, we're more grateful that your continued leadership on the committee uh, will help build the networks and the technologies and the competition of the future. So thank you. I'd like to... Uh, Now, Senator Pryor serves with the, uh, the senator from Mississippi. Uh, uh, they are the, ch the chair and the ranking of the, of the Telecom Subcommittee in the Senate uh, on the Commerce Committee, the Senate Commerce Committee, where I had my formative experience of, of working on the Telecommunications Act of, of 96. Or as my friend uh, Kevin Joseph would say, I, I only worked on the 95 Act, and then I went home to run for Congress, and he helped uh, with Ed Markey passed the 96 Act. So, uh, Senator Markey, I'd love to uh, bring you up and kind of introduce our, our, our guest on this panel and to set the context for the discussion and the future remarks. Ed, come on up on the stage. Now, what, what would unite a liberal Democrat from Massachusetts and a conservative Republican from Mississippi, a free market most conservative leader of the House, John Shattig, and a gentleman from Virginia as chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee in 1996, Chairman uh, Bliley. What would, what would unite the, the, the farthest ends of the political spectrum? What is this compact? What, what brings us together to make the 96 Act and then everything that, that came from it? If you think about the telecom revolution, the digital age, the information, the knowledge uh, economy. What was the, the basic principle that allowed us to unite and do something that had tremendous, tremendous benefit to the country? And it's around this principle of, uh, of competition. It gives us a bipartisan compact. Chairman Wheeler talked about a, a, a network compact, which talks about the social compact and the economic compact. But this bipartisan compact said, competition brings about free markets. Free market competition allows us to, to gradually over time reduce regulations and the individual freedom is increased, the market freedom is increased. And Democrats, like Ed Markey would say, competition is best for consumers. And around this one principle, we can unite both sides of the aisle, and both ends of the spectrum, and we can do good things for the country. Part of our purpose being here today is to celebrate the bipartisan compact and to help restore it, reestablish it, and renew it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed Markey. Thank you. The best. The best. <clears throat> Thank you, Chip, so much. Um, and, uh, and what is it that can unite a Republican from the heart of Mississippi with a Democrat from um, Boston, Massachusetts? It is this commitment to competition and uh, helping consumers through uh, the advent of uh, Darwinian paranoia-inducing competition. That's really what it's all about. It's about ensuring that uh, out in the marketplace, the, uh, <clears throat> the companies know that the consumer is king or queen and, uh, and, uh, and as a result uh, must have the best possible services at the lowest possible prices. And uh, that only happens if they feel there's a competitor who will come along and to provide something which is better and lower price. So that's really what the game is all about. And uh, I thank you, Chip, for all of your help in ensuring that we have this ongoing campaign to guarantee that there is competition uh, in the telecommunications marketplace. And <clears throat> if you were going to put together an all-star team to speak on a conference like this, the starting team would be Mark Pryor, Tom Bliley, John Shattuck, Michael Copps, Gene Kimmelman. Uh, they would be the starters on the team. Okay, that would be put out on the field to uh, fight for the principles of competition, uh, of ensuring that the consumer is, in fact, most uh, protected. And, um, and it's so great to see Tom Bliley here. Tom. Tom made sure, by the way, 
uh, when we were doing all of the telecommunications law during his tenure as the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, that it was done uh, in a way that was totally bipartisan, uh, that uh, basically took people who were committed uh, to competition, built that coalition, and then we were successful ultimately in passing these historic laws, which transformed the telecommunications marketplace. So it's a great honor to be here with that giant, Tom Bliley, today, and, uh, uh, and uh, it's so good to see you, and uh, my best to Mary Virginia as well. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and I thank you for everything that you did. Um, we're here in the uh, Library of Congress, uh, which is altogether fitting and appropriate because it is here where President Clinton signed the 1996 Telecommunications Act, and, uh, and he signed it just around the corner, um, and he signed it with a digital pen, uh, signaling this movement from analog to digital, from narrow band to broadband, uh, which was the goal of that legislation. And um, the president gave me that digital pen, which I have framed in my office that, uh, that transformed the telecommunications uh, marketplace. And, uh, and even as I sit here, um, I can actually see people who are looking at their wireless devices and not even looking up to listen to me. And, <laughs> and honestly, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of it. And, and my hope is that we reach a day um, where people never have to look up again. And, <laughs> Never, never have any human interaction <laughs> with the actual people sitting there. And, and, um, and even as I make jokes about them, they're not going to be deterred, and they're going to continue to look at their devices. That's how, that's how transformative this revolution has become within our society. And, uh, and we just have to continue um, it uh, <clears throat> at, uh, at a race that, uh, at a pace that uh, actually would have Adam Smith looking up from his grave and smiling uh, at the pace of, of competition which exists in the marketplace. So <clears throat> when I first started working on telecommunications uh, issues in 1977, 38 years ago, on the Telecommunications Committee, I have served continuously on the Telecommunications Committee in the House of Senate for 38 consecutive years, never before attempted, in, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not worried about it being duplicated either. Um, but it was during this incredible transformative period um, that uh, we had to begin to discuss the state of competition. You know, we had one phone company, 1.2 million employees, conveniently with 3,000 employees in all 435 congressional districts. Uh, and so each of us was confronted with the exact same question, do we want to have more competition or do we not? Um, so it wasn't something that was regional, it was something that was more philosophical. Huh? What is the best way of ensuring that we unleash uh, a real revolution? Uh, but because we only had one phone company, the phone company, uh, consumers suffered, businesses suffered, innovation suffered. So I strongly supported the Justice Department efforts to break up AT&T. Uh, the professors at Harvard and MIT in the 70s were telling me that it could unleash an incredible data revolution in our society. That data was just waiting to be transmitted uh, over these wires. And so, <clears throat> and so this was something uh, that I felt uh, and had become convinced was absolutely impo incredibly important. I still hear people say the 1996 Act was not about data. It was not about, it was not about uh, <clears throat> you know, tra transforming the network so that data and voice and video could all go over the same networks. But I beg to differ because the, the philosophers who were talking about this in the 70s, in the early 80s, were saying that this is exactly what would happen. So this eternal struggle for a competitive landscape uh, <clears throat> uh, makes our society more nimble, innovative, entrepreneurial. New entrants can get in. Uh, and, uh, and early on in my career, I had to take the politically counterintuitive position 
of backing the companies that did not exist yet uh, against the only company that did exist that had 1.2 million employees, which is not something to be recommended for everyone <laughs> politically. But that's what you had to do if you wanted to see this kind of a revolution. And Mark Cooper knows this. Everyone who was here understands the essence of this. So why would I take on the incumbents? Uh, because if we don't, um, then uh, we, missed, we missed the point that it's the smaller companies who are historically the innovators, not the broadband um, behemoths. Um, that uh, over time, we understand where the innovation, where the change, where the new ideas, where the not new job creation is going to come from. Uh, and I've always believed that cozy cooperation of communications colossi hurts consumers and limits the choices. And so how did we get here today? Well, we had to make a lot of decisions. We had, to decide, we had to decide in 1993 to put in 200 megahertz of spectrum uh, it, in order to create the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth cell phone license. The first two licenses that had existed uh, for years and years were both uh, analog, and the cost was more than 50 cents a minute. The device was the size of a brick, and you didn't have one. But by moving over the 200 megahertz um, and cooperating with the FCC so that the <clears throat> two incumbents were not able to bid for the spectrum in the areas where they were already serving. Um, we moved very rapidly by 1995, just in the blink of an eye, two to three years, we moved to a point where just about every American was now putting a cell phone in their pocket. That's the year you started to buy your cell phone, 1995 and 1996, because the price had dropped to under 10 cents a minute, it had gone digital, and boom, we had the revolution. Now, which companies win, which companies lose? Well, we don't really care. As long as there were six companies out there, as long as there was Darwinian competition, as long as people knew that if they didn't move rapidly, they were gonna lose customers. Uh, and the more that there was technological innovation is the more that the the consumer was going to migrate over to those that were the ones that were providing the best services at the lowest cost. So then in 1996, we, <clears throat> we passed the, the Telecommunications Act, and it was signed, as I said, here in the Library of Congress. Uh, and on that day, uh, back in February of 1996, no homes in America had broadband. Just the blink of an eye, 18 years. Huh? Today, a 12-year-old believes it's a constitutional right to have, right, to have a 50-inch screen uh, with massive broadband interconnectivity uh, so that they can um, perhaps never leave their living room or their bedroom. <laughs> huh? that's, that's the goal of modern society. But it happened because we had a plan. America had a plan. We put it together in the 1996 Act. We were going to unleash this broadband revolution that had $1 trillion of private sector investment that went in. Uh, and we also made sure in that Act that there was uh, interconnectivity for competitors, uh, that it wouldn't just be a small number of companies, but it would be many companies um, that would be able to get in and to transform the way in which uh, we provide these services in our country. And it wasn't easy. Uh, last night here at the Library of Congress, um, <clears throat> Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, spoke about her new book about Teddy Roosevelt uh, and William Howard Taft and the bully pulpit. And a big part of that book is about Teddy Roosevelt, the trust buster. How do you break up these conglomerates that get put together that stifle competition, that seek to extract uh, higher rents from ordinary consumers or other companies because uh, they are in a non-competitive relationship with the dominant uh, companies in the industry. Okay? And that's what she was talking about here tonight. And then you fast forward 100 years and we're still having the same discussion. We're still talking about the very same issues uh, that uh, were being discussed um, a century ago. And today, <coughs> Um, we have companies like Granite Communications up in Massachusetts with 1,200 employees, but we've got companies all across um, 
this country that would not exist without the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Just wouldn't exist because they could not gain access to this closed network. And today, our phone network is moving away from traditional technology to uh, IP, to an internet protocol. Yet the tenets of the 1996 Act, promoting competition, expanding consumer choice, spurring economic growth, are as relevant and vital today as they were 18 years ago when President Clinton signed the bill into law. The Act's principles were meant to be technology neutral. We must remember that technology is neither inherently good nor inherently bad. With each innovation, our task is to ensure that we infuse new technologies consistent with our time-tested values and principles. And that's what I will continue to do as I fight in the United States Senate to ensure that we have competition in this marketplace based upon the best technologies uh, that are invented and developed. Recently, there have been some critics of the law suggesting that the 1996 Telecom Act was written about old rules, about an old network. They have suggested the bipartisan work we put into that bill no longer applies to telecommunications networks of today. But if it was just a bill about the old phone network, we would have simply held the bill signing in front of a phone booth or at a telephone switching center, but we didn't. <clears throat> Instead, we signed the 1996 Telecom Act here in the Library of Congress, the American shrine of knowledge, of accessibility for everyone uh, to the information which they needed. So today, because of the 1996 Act, volumes of information extend beyond the stacks of the, book, of, of the books in the Jefferson Library, beyond the walls of this great building, and into the homes and the schools of every child in America, where they live, where they go to school. Today, kids growing up in Malden, Massachusetts can read the works of Jefferson on their iPad. The 1996 Act was the future then. The 1996 Act is the future today. The 1996 Act is the future tomorrow because it embraces and embodies the principles which are central to guaranteeing that we have an ongoing revolution in technology and accessibility within our society. When people in Washington talk about job creators, they are talking about all of you. You are the reason that innovation and investment will continue to drive our economy into the 21st century. That is why I have partnered with you over the years uh, to ensure that we continue to drive this agenda. And it is why I'm going to continue to partner with you for as long as I am a United States Senator. And since there is no, no known instance of an Irishman from Massachusetts voluntarily leaving Congress, I, <laughs> that will be a long time uh, in order to ensure that we put in place the principles to guarantee competition in our country. Thank you all so much for everything that you do. Tommy. Great to see you. Always the best. The best to Susan. Well done, Tim. Thank you, John. Ed, thank you very much. And I am uh, not only grateful that you came, but I'm also grateful that you went to the, to the great chamber in the Senate so that you can educate and inform and bring up a new generation of senators uh, that are always known for being youthful and energetic and, and visionary. <laughs> and so it, it is. In the Senate, I feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, to Markey. Uh, let me uh, do something to bring some balance to this panel. Let me bring up Gene Kimmelman and Commissioner Michael Copps uh, as well. And then I'm going to introduce Tom Bliley, Chairman Bliley. This is that, that compact of consumers and competitors that we've been discussing. Uh, Chairman Bliley presided over the first uh, Energy and Commerce Committee led by a Republican in 40 years after the 1994 Republican, what they called the Republican Revolution of that time. 
So you have a, a new entrant into, into Congress, a new majority, a reform agenda across every sector of every part of our economy. And Tom Blyley, as chair, led uh, that, that period of time when we were so productive, a, re, a new Republican Congress with President Clinton and Vice President Gore. Again, how do you work together and how do you form the, the compact that we were discussing? And Tom Blyley led uh, during that time, and he has an impressive list, long list of legislative accomplishments in the most productive legislative period in the last 20 years, the last two decades. So it's my, my privilege to introduce Chairman Blyley, and I'll tell one last thing. I was desperately in 1996 trying to get on the Energy and Commerce Committee as a freshman. I didn't make it. So the next two years, I was trying to convince him to let me to, uh, to be a member on the committee. And his test for me was not only will you be pro-competitive on telecommunications, but to prove to me that you'll take on any monopoly anywhere, anytime, you've got to lead the caucus to break up the electric utilities and the monopolies. And I'm thinking, he's trying to get me killed. <laughs> so, so with that, I'm going to uh, have Chairman Blyley come up. Thank you, Chip. Let me uh, d just say at the outset that Comtel and its members, uh, they are in very good hands. Uh, Chip has always been a champion of competition. Let me tell you a quick story. When I, when I left the chair as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, the new chair, well, let's just say that he was not uh, on the same wavelength as I was as far as competition was concerned. When the new chair moved the broadband legislation that was very pro-Bell, Chip was in there at the markup in open session, and he yells out, sham! <laughs> and uh, this, you know, this is his second term or so on the, on the Commerce Committee, a relatively new member. Uh, and the, chair, the chairman's bill, and he calls it a sham. So uh, uh, you can imagine <laughs> how that went over. But anyway, it's been a long and fascinating 18 years since the 96 Act passed, uh, and I really believe that the foundation of the Act uh, was competition, just as uh, Senator Barkey just, just told us. Um, that, I think, was what brought the act to fruition. We'd been working on telecommunications, trying to get a bill uh, ever since uh, the breakup of AT&T in the early 80s. And every Congress, we've, we would fall by the wayside and, and not succeed. But I think the reason the act passed at this time uh, was the fact that it was pro-competition, uh, and because of that, uh, we had a large bipartisan majority to pass it. I'll never forget at the end, we were in a conference, and uh, my chief of staff, uh, J.D. Dedurian, whom some of you know, uh, <clears throat> came to me and he said, uh, the staff, we've worked out the, the low-hanging fruit, but these are the issues that the, that the members have to decide. Why don't you call a meeting? I said, okay. So I called Trent Lott. I said, Trent, I want to use your hideaway in the Capitol tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock. I don't want you. I just want your room. And he said, okay. So I called uh, Senator Pressler uh, and, and Senator Hollins, his, his ranking member, and John Dingell and myself, and we, we met uh, at 3 o'clock, and we went down the list. Uh, some of the things I won, some of the things I lost, but we got a bill. And I brought it back, and some of my, my colleagues said, you, you gave too much, you didn't get this, you didn't get that. Trent Lott was sitting there, and Trent said, and Newt and the other leadership, and he said, well, you know, guys, we've been working on this a long time. We haven't gotten too much to show for it. I think we've got a pretty good bill, and let's go with it. And so that's the way, that's the way it passed. Uh, but 
competition is the answer, and it's just as true today, if not more true, than it ever was, as we are seeing the uh, consolidation of uh, telecommunications interest uh, throughout the country. And thank heavens for companies like Comtel, uh, who are there to emphasize the, the merits and the need for competition, whether it's before the FCC or before the Congress or whomever. Uh, we have to do that. And I certainly enjoy being here with you today. I look forward to working with you and meeting all of you. And you have a great day. I'm going to introduce uh, Gene Kimmelman now, next. Uh, is a leader of public knowledge, but has been an advocate for consumer interest uh, since the, the 1980s. And uh, I do like to, to tell my Democratic friends it was Ronald Reagan who broke up AT&T. And uh, so the Roosevelt to Reagan to Gene Kimmelman. <laughs> Thank you, Chip. Um, you missed Bill Baxter in there somewhere, yeah. too, another great Republican antitrust thinker. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's an honor to be here. And um, I'm going to be very brief, because you've heard from the real luminaries. Uh, but a couple things have jumped out at me today, having been through these wars before and listening to all the discussion of bipartisanship. It's really um, wonderful when you come from the protection of consumers approach to telecommunications policy and internet policy to hear all these wonderful Comtel members, members of the Broadband Coalition come up and talk about the quality of service they need and that they get from working together in a competitive environment, the special needs that small companies can offer, small businesses uh, to target the benefits that their customers, their consumers need, to hear about how you can deliver health care in rural America and its small companies driving that innovation, um, whether it's our security and safety at home uh, or just the general day-to-day -day needs of our citizens from nonprofit organizations like my own uh, to the average consumer. It's the members of Comtel and that broadband coalition who I think this morning really described something that we don't think about every day. We think about the big companies, the AT&Ts, the Verizons, uh, and all the policy fights. But it's these small companies who are there because of the law, I would argue. Um, it wasn't natural. It wasn't automatic. Uh, you've been hearing all this discussion about the wonders of competition. The competition is hard. Competition isn't easy because as Senator Markey described it, there was a monopoly that was a fundamental bottleneck. As former Chairman Bliley just said, there's consolidation all over the place that threatens these things. And it is the policing function, the accountability that comes from the bipartisan cooperation that went into the 96 law that creates these competitive opportunities and sustains them. And as Mr. Bliley just said, they're being challenged every day. So when I think about how to represent the interests of consumers, of users, it's gone from the old world of telephone service to the internet. Um, this building uh, reminds me of something really important that goes beyond, I believe, what everybody has said today. Senator, Senator Markey mentioned the library itself and the repository of knowledge here. But when you hear people talk about where we are today because of these wonderful policies, you also hear an awful lot of discussion of my individual rights to say what I want on the internet or to get what I want on the internet or my ability to find out anything on the internet from this repository of knowledge here or anywhere else in the world. And what we have kind of walked ourselves into is something I think that's even deeper than what we were thinking of in 1996 as we were opening the door to competition. It's all about freedom of expression. This is now, and it's interesting to see in an FCC proceeding, even those words pop up in a notice of proposed rulemaking. I mean, that's not by chance. 
That's because what has been developed here around competition are not just all those wonderful things you heard from all the companies this morning. It is also about our ability to exercise our basic rights, First Amendment rights, and our rights to participate in democracy. And that is what I think is most important about rebuilding the bipartisan coalition that Chip talked about. And I'm really hopeful, based on everything I've heard today, that we can get there. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you very much. The next uh, guest that I want to uh, call up is a good friend of mine, uh, uh, John Shattuck. Not only did he promote competition and defend competition in telecom, but it seemed like he was always promoting, always fighting for more competition in energy, more competition in health care, more competition in education, more competition in, in insurance. Every single sector, he was trying to find a way to promote competition. He was the leader of the Republican Study Committee. For those of you who know, uh, that is the, uh, viewed as the most conservative Republican uh, uh, thinkers, policymakers, legislators, and um, I'm very proud that John is here from a free market, competitive conservative to talk about the Telecom Act. Thank you very much, Chip. It is a privilege and an honor to be here. It's actually exciting uh, to kind of think back of all the things that have been accomplished. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working, Chip, with you and the industry. I don't know if you noticed this trend, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Each of the current members of Congress or the Senate that's gotten here to this microphone has said, well, I want to acknowledge my staffer. And Chairman Bliley and I and you as ex-members, I don't know, I don't have a staffer here. I, somehow I think I'm getting to staff myself these days. But I, there's nothing I wouldn't rather staff myself on than a good fight like this over why competition is better and over some of the arguments that are launched against it. Uh, you didn't come until 19, following 96 election. I got elected in the revolution of 1994, as you mentioned, uh, and I thought it was kind of funny. Ed Markey talked about the brick. Some of you, probably some of you are too young, but some, most of you, remember the brick. It was large, gray, made by Motorola, and it took almost two hands to carry. In 1995, when I joined the Congress, I carried the brick back and forth, uh, from the Cannon Building to the floor of the House, and most of my colleagues laughed at me. And now today, uh, we can do so much more. It's absolutely uh, incredible how far we've come, all as a result of a change in the law. And I think that's very important to understand. I spent, as Chip said, 16 years in the U.S. House, uh, pushing competition everywhere I could. Uh, and as was just said, competition is hard. Um, it indeed is very challenging. It, it results in some companies failing, but it also results in other companies succeeding and innovating, and it produces a better world. It drives innovation, it drives new ideas, it drives better products, it drives lower prices and better lives. I think those last two are the ones that are key for Ed Markey, and his animation on this issue is pretty spectacular. The reality is people who could not otherwise afford that brick when it was out today, uh, all have a telephone, uh, a smartphone, and not only can talk constantly to whoever they want at any time in an instant, but as Chip said, when he held up his smartphone, can literally access every piece of information and data in the books in this building. Uh, I wanna uh, uh, echo the words of Chairman Bliley. Uh, it is uh, stunning that we had a chairman with that kind of vision uh, who understood the importance of competition. I have to tell a little story on him. Uh, like Chip, I didn't get to the Commerce Committee on my first term in Congress. Uh, I didn't get there until my second, and when I got there, uh, I love the chairman, but he had a great deal of trouble pronouncing my name. As a matter of fact, for pretty much the entire first year I was on the committee, he always mispronounced it when he in would, introduce him, would introduce me. But finally we had a competition, and we had a competition about telecom competition, and he kind of lit up like a light bulb, and from that moment forward, he had my name down dead right. So I want to thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. I knew then that this was an important topic to you. Um, and it's exciting to be here working on the same issues Chip and I were working on back then. Uh, 
it's been adverted to that the chairman of the committee put forward a broadband bill when Chip and I were on the committee that Chip and I didn't like very much. Uh, it's not always fun to be on the opposite side of your chairman uh, when you're on the committee, but with Chip in the lead and me just carrying his water because he knew the issue inside out and backwards, we had a good time with that bill, uh, and I'm looking forward to working on those issues again. Uh, America needs more competition in this field, and if you stop and think about it, it, is the competition in this field which has made this field one that is advancing most quickly. Uh, the discussion we had this morning with these panelists, talking about how from the software business uh, all the way to uh, healthcare to nonprofits, the innovation of tele telecom, the competition that occurs, uh, has enabled all those businesses to do so much more than they can do now. Our message on Capitol Hill appeals to conservatives like me who understand uh, the benefits of competition, but it also should appeal to every single member. You get better service, you get innovative pro products at lower prices. Um, I'm excited about this. I think one of the interesting things is the anomaly of one of the arguments the other side makes. The incumbents, and Senator Markey referred to this, come in every once in a while and they say, well, let's trot out the old arguments again. Let's get out that argument that says, well, if we pass rules and regulations to deal with telecom, we are in fact uh, being anti-competitive and we all know that over-regulation by the government is bad. Yeah, well, think about the context in which they make that argument. They are very large incumbents. They were created as monopolies. They had all the benefits of having been created as monopolies, and guess what? They don't like. They don't like competitions. So to win over my friends in the conservative field, they say, oh, well, rules and regulations are per se bad. Let me make it clear to you that's simply wrong. Rules and regulations which promote competition, which set a level playing field, which enable small companies in the CLEC business and the communications business to compete with the big dogs on a level playing field are exactly what we need to continue to move this field forward. I'd like to see that kind of level, as Chip said, in the healthcare industry, right? Frankly, I was sitting about it and thinking about it, it needs to be there in the, in the energy industry more than it is today. But this is an exciting fight to be in, uh, and I couldn't uh, wish for a better leader than uh, Chip Pickering in, the, in this effort, and I'm thrilled to be here and be a part of it, Chip. Uh, John, that, um, I have to admit, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, hearing a conservative Republican make the case for competition is music to my ears. <laughs> and so uh, this is a good fight. It's worth the fight. And we are going to build a good coalition of con uh, customers, but also reestablish re re the bipartisan coalition that has brought us three decades of competitive policy and now on the verge of the major decisions facing the Congress and the FCC, we can win this fight, maintain uh, the competitive policy that we need for our country's future. Jim, I'd like you to come up because you're gonna close. I'm going to recognize uh, Michael Copps, uh, Commissioner Copps, uh, both from Senator Holling's uh, staff and then uh, at the FCC. No one was a greater advocate, a stronger, more consistent advocate for both the consumer and for competition, for rural markets and the services, uh, both universal service and the E-rate and the education and what we're now seeing for health care. And so Commissioner Copps, uh, please come and we, we're grateful to your leadership. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Kevin. It is wonderful to be with so many old friends. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be back in this building. I began plying the halls of this place back when I worked with your friend Fritz Hollings uh, many years ago, 1970 to be exact. So, uh, so this is a great, uh, a great uh, reunion. Uh, thank you to Comtel and my friend Chip Pickering for the terrific work you do to make sure that the transformative power of broadband connects individuals and communities all across this land of ours. I'm not here to celebrate. I'm here to advocate. I think we have justifiable things to celebrate that many of the companies have brought to our attention uh, this morning. You have shown what competition can do when competition is given a chance. The problem is we haven't give, given competition the chance that it needs. And this is particularly true today in broadband. 
We have fallen so far short of this essential objective of bringing broadband to every citizen in this country, no matter who they are, where they live, their ethnicity, the particular circumstances of their individual lives, that we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. No matter how you measure it, speed, prices, penetration, whatever, your country of my, and mine is 15th or 24th or 33rd or 55th, depending upon what metric is being used, what study you're reading. You debate those specific studies if you want. I don't think there's much use in that. We should be leading the vanguard, and we're not. To regain our global competitiveness, to open the door of opportunity for any, every individual in this land, we need to get serious about broadband. We need to get serious about competition. We need to get serious about our country. Yet here we are in 2014, and what do we see around us? More of the merger madness that sent us down the wrong road in the first place. And a Federal Communications Commission that might yet approve still more of this insanity in the form of a Time Warner cable Comcast merger, ATT, DirecTV, maybe throw in Sprint T-Mobile. Once upon a time, I used to teach American history long ago, and I can tell you this, at no time, not even in those notorious days of the Gilded Age back in the 1880s or the 1890s, were we ever in more urgent need of laws and regulations to protect individual Americans. No more, never more in a more crying need for legislators and regulators that would stand up and do this. Remember this, the consolidated world of telecom and media that we have today did not devolve from the hand of God. It did not devolve from the mysterious workings of natural law or the inevitability of market-based economics. Consolidation was instituted and perpetuated by conscious public policy choices. Decisions made at the federal level, in the Congress, and more specifically by the abdication of its responsibilities of public interest oversight for more than 30 years by the Federal Communications Commission where I served for almost 11 years. So instead of a guaranteed bright broadband future, we have now the likelihood of gatekeeper control over the internet, history's most innovative and opportunity creating platform since the printing press. Competition, competition? yes we have some and we're proud of it, but we need so, so much more. Consumer protection, low cost, high speed broadband for everybody, the list goes on. But my friend Gene Kimmelman put his thumb on the crux of the problem because communications is the lifeblood of our democracy. Our founders who helped build this magnificent library understood that building infrastructure and enabling communications across the land and subsidizing the distribution of news and information so you could have an informed electorate, so you could have intelligent elections, so you could have good decisions made in the public interest could actually happen, so we could govern ourselves. That's at the heart of the story we should be telling ourselves. A later set of leaders drafted the Communications Act, and I agree with many of the folks who spoke here today that that Communications Act should be our lodestar. Uh, the trouble was so many companies took it to court and tried to vitiate it, and then the Federal, Reg Federal uh, Communications Commission continued the job with uh, deregulating away so many of the competitive uh, provisions of that act. So no long speech today, but I just want you to take this away with you. Our democracy depends upon what happens between now and the end of this year. This is not something we should come back next year and talk about again. Are we going to have an open internet? Are we going to have a national mission to put broadband out to uh, everybody? Are we going to have legislators with enough gumption and regulators with enough gumption to step up to the plate and make this happen? It can happen. I know it can happen. I've seen us stop a lot of good things in the city, but now we've got to put our attention on launching some really good things, but it won't happen without you, 
and without millions more like you, speaking up, organizing, demanding our rights as to a communications ecosystem that includes each and every one of us and each and every one of our fellow citizens around the land. Whose internet is it anyway? And whose democracy is it anyway? Thank you very much. You know, um, this has been a, a good day. As we kind of celebrate, uh, we recognize the stories of the, the companies that came today and their customers, and the benefits that, that flow uh, to our country because of that. We're very thankful for each member that has come to speak and every former member, uh, to the advocates you know, this is a representation of a very, very broad part and significant and critical part of our country. The stakes are high, and the forces for protectionism, some would say cronyism, are very great. Competition does work, though, and it always equalizes the opportunities, creates the opportunities, and makes our country better and our democracy stronger when we follow that simple principle that unites both left and right consumers and free market uh, conservatives. So we want to uh, continue this fight and continue telling the story. One way to, to end today, or the best way I think to end today, is with the story of, of what competition has brought to our local communities and to our schools. Uh, Jim Butman, a leader uh, both for Comptel and, and his company, has a, a great uh, video that we're going to close with today that tells that part of the story. And I want to thank everyone who helped to, uh, make today possible. I thank all of uh, the Comptel staff, the Broadband Coalition, and every company that has come and the customers that have come today. So thank you all very much. And Jim, please come. Well, I had some notes, I don't need those anymore, because everything's been said except amen, okay? I mean, what a great day. I guess you do get it in Washington. I, uh, I'm a Midwestern boy, I'm back there running the company. Every time I come to DC, I gotta catch up with what's going on, but you get it, thank you. Um, my title is Group President at TDS. And have a unique perspective because we have operations in ILEC. Really, the company was formed out of rural ILEC in 30 states of this country. We've got ILECs. And now, in the new world, we are actually acquiring cable TV operations. But after the 1996 Act, I was tapped to develop within our company the CLEC operations. Now, there just aren't very many telecom traditional incumbents that went into the CLEC business, right? Just a few of us. Well, we've been there every step of the way, okay? We've earned, in the Midwest, we're very concentrated in our CLEC operations. We're in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota, Northern Illinois. We've earned, through competition and the enablement of the Telecom Act, over 30,000 small business customers. And I can't say it better than what you're going to see from one of our customers. And I want you to know, this wasn't done for this event. Our customers, I heard today, competition is hard. You're damn right it's hard. And our employees work really hard. And this video demonstrates our employees in the CLEC operations and all the competitive carriers. We did this to keep them going, to keep them motivated, to show them the great work that they're doing. And so we have a whole, a whole number of these videos that we sh show our employees periodically to remind them what they're doing. And this is what the competitive industry is doing. Last thing I'll say, it was my, it's my way of saying what competition does. It makes everyone smarter. Our customers are smarter. Our competitors are smarter. Policy people are smarter. Our legislators are smarter. We as leaders of the companies are smarter and just everyone, everything gets better. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video. <laughs>